7 o'clock and it's time for Chai and Wai. Please come and find a place. Uh, thank you all for coming on a rainy Sunday. And uh, I know we have a long journey to go to the moon today, but before that, let me tell you about uh, Chai and Wai. Any first timers here? Oh, a lot of you. Okay, oh, very good. Cool. Quite a lot. Okay. So, Chai and Wai is uh, an effort of the IFR that somebody or the other is there every two weeks to talk about something interesting from the world of science. On the first Sunday at 11 o'clock, we are always here at Prithvi Theatre. On the third Sunday, we are at Ruparel College in Matunga. And if a month has a fifth Sunday, like this month, uh, we will be at Alexandra School in Ford. Uh, and the best way to find out about Chai and is to check our Facebook page. Everything is announced there and you can always write to us over there or you can email us outreach at the IFR. Let me tell you the next uh, programs that are coming up. Um, the next program, the mid-September one, September 15th is Engineers Day in India. And to celebrate that, we're going to have something on design. Design is a very, very critical component, uh, whether you're making a rocket to take something to the moon or a lander on the moon or even a simple comb or whatever else. Uh, design is very important. And we have Anisha, who is a postdoc at HBCSE, uh, is going to do a hands-on session where we will explore creativity and the world of design by making various objects. So this is going to happen uh, every day design and design every day in Parel College two weeks from now. And uh, at the end of the month, our fifth Sunday special is again a sort of experimental one. Uh, it's called Make It Crystal Clear uh, by Uttam Kulkarni from Tigayapa. And she is going to be talking about the wonderful world of crystals and uh, we will make we will try and actually grow crystals in the program itself. You can try it. Um, that's bismuth, for example. Bismuth, normal metal is like this. You can make crystals out of it. You can get beautiful colors. Um, we will try to do it. Let's see what happens. So uh, uh, join us on uh, uh, September 29th as well. Uh, the one over here on October 6th is still, we will announce it in a couple of days. OK. And just remember to follow us on Facebook or Twitter. It's at Chai is the handle. Uh, please follow us and you can get updated about what's happening and do ask questions and suggest topics on what you'd like to hear um, and so on. Okay, with that it's time to switch to the topic for today and it's a pleasure to welcome again Maya Vahia. So, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and he says no introduction but I must introduce him because some things have to be said. Uh, Astronomer at TI for 39 years, all that, the professional part you know, uh, he's given five chai and wise, it's also fine. But the most important thing is the Science Popularization and Outreach Committee of TIFR, which runs this program for, for the public, uh, it was started by me. Um, thanks for the compliment. Um, it's my fifth chai and why it's a pleasure to be here and especially to talk something about um, Chandrayaan missions. I'm going to focus on the two Chandrayaan missions. I'm not going to talk about space in general because I think there is a lot to be seen about the uh, Chandrayaan. So let us look at what moon is. And the moon, of course, is the Earth's only, only natural satellite. Um, it is one-fourth the size of Earth. It is one-eighth its weight. So for people like me, it's very good because we weigh much less on moon than we would weigh on Earth, which is always welcome. Moon has an average distance of 384,000 kilo kilometers, about 30 times the Earth's moon radius. And therefore, going there takes time. Moon was formed, as far as we know, four and a, four and a half billion years ago in a rather hot molten plasma, which arose when another object the size of Mars came and hit the Earth, and a lot of debris was thrown out after, from which um, Moon was formed. And I will show you at least one signature about why we know that Moon must have been hot, molten lava at some stage, and how do we put an age on these things. Moon is in synchronous rotation to Earth. So essentially, you see the same phase of the Moon all the time. Um, and conversely, if you are on the Moon, Earth appears stationary in the sky. It may wax and wane with time, but essentially it is in the same, same place in the sky. So if astronomy was to begin 
on moon rather than earth, it would be a very confusing thing because you know, on earth all the stars and all the objects move in the night sky. In the moon's night sky, the earth does not move. Uh, other parts about reaching moon, the moon is not a very large object. It is like hitting a 10 rupee coin 10 meters away um, with, a, with essentially a grain of sand and when the, when the, when the coin itself is moving at some 4000 kilometers per hour, it is a non-trivial exercise. A 10 rupee coin 10 meters away to be hit by a grain of sand, uh, when, the, when the coin itself is moving at 4000 kilometers per se hour is not an easy task to gain and therefore mo and most all space agencies except Indian one failed in their first attempt to reach moon because it is not an easy thing to do. Moon was first reached in September 1959 uh, by a Russian mission called Lunar, uh, Lunar 2 and because the, these were the heydays of Cold War and so on, very quickly six months later or nine months later, sorry, six years later, um, Luna 9 also soft landed on the moon. Soon after that, Apollo Americans took up the challenge of putting man on moon. In July um, 1969, uh, Neil Armstrong reached moon. Uh, since then, there have been 12 people who have men who have walked on moon, and Apollo 17 was the last mission which carried a human being to moon, and that was in 72. We don't know a lot about the moon. In spite of all the missions that have gone and multiple missions that have gone and moon is so close by etc., we still have lots of doubts. The first thing we do not know is really are we 100 percent sure that moon was born in a collision with another object? We are not. There is still some data to be found because after all what we have achieved so far is minor samples from some specific locations here and there on moon. Full data really is not yet completely available. Surface data is available but not too much of detail. Uh, there have always, there had always been speculations about uh, water on moon and humans have searched for water on moon because if you want to colonize the moon, water is going to be critical and you do not want to carry that huge quantity of water. So, water was a big issue in moon missions and the third of course is that at some stage humans will develop enough technology to mine the moon. So, if you want to mine the moon, you really want to know where the mine has to be set up depending on what metal you want. So, we wanted to know the mineralogy of moon, really get some more insights into its origin and find out whether there is water on moon or not. So, there are several questions that still remain. But if you think Indians were unique in reaching the moon, we were not. There have been 123 missions to moon so far, 123 human missions to moon. Out of which 64 succeeded, 59 failed. So, almost 50 percent failure rate. Uh, the missions have been from the Russian Space Agency, American Space Agency, European Space Agency, Japanese, Indian and Chinese Space Agency. And uh, about 3, 4 months ago, one Israeli private company took an American rocket and sent a mission to moon. They wanted to land softly, did not succeed it went and crashed on the moon. But private attempts to reach the moon have also started and we will talk about it at the end of my presentation. 52 missions out of these 123 were flyby. They just took a look at the moon and moved ahead to go somewhere else. 68 had orbiters which went around the moon, 10 had landers or impactors which, which fell on the moon including Chandrayaan 1, 9 were manned mission out of which one did not make it. Uh, two were orbiters, four were landers and three were landers with rovers. So, the, we have three cars on moon and as of next Sunday, we will have another car running on the moon thanks to Chandrayaan 2. <laughs> Thank you, Sro, for it. Um, the first attempt uh, was on August 7, uh, August 17, 1958, which did not make it. The first successful one, like I said, was by Soviet Union in 1959. Chandrayaan 1, when it went off, was the 118th mission to moon and Chandrayaan 2 is the 123rd mission to moon. Um, okay. This is an interesting graph of number of missions to moon during Cold War from 1955 to 1979. 
there was a big competition between America and USSR to reach the moon and who would reach the moon first and so on. So there were a whole lot of missions to moon in the initial days. Then there was a complete lull from 78 to 90. For 12 years, there wasn't a single mission to moon. Then Japan showed interest to go in going to moon and so on. India's first mission was over here. India's second mission is over here. And now, of course, various countries have joined in in this race to go to the moon. But it's interesting to see this huge gap and this huge difference in the intensity of the number of missions to moon. Our first mission, Chandrayaan-1, was on a rocket called PSLV um, rocket, which is, which is somewhat lower in capacity. It could only take about 1,500 to 2,000 kilogram payload. And therefore, the Chandrayaan-1 was much lighter than um, we would have liked it to be. On the other hand, Chandrayaan-2 went up on GSLV Mark III, which can take much higher weightage of up to 4,000 kilogram. So on Chandrayaan-2, we have a rover and a lander and whole bunch of things, because now we have more powerful rocket until we, compared to what we had 10 years ago, and that has given us additional capability. This is what Chandra, uh, PSLV looks like for those who are interested in rockets. Essentially, no single rocket ever works. Everybody has a rocket on top of a rocket and so on, and they are called stages. So PSLV has first rocket over here, second rocket over here, third rocket over here, and the fourth rocket right on top. And that gives us the, it's the capabilities to launch satellites and so on. Compared to that, GSLV or GSLV Mark III is more sophisticated in the sense that even though the first and the second stage look similar, the third stage uses a more efficient fuel. The third stage uses hydrogen and oxygen, uh, burns hydrogen and oxygen essentially to produce water, but that is the most efficient fuel you can think of. The problem with that fuel is that at um, now, room temperatures, oxygen and hydrogen both remain gaseous. And so if you want to carry a gas, you have to carry much greater volume. So you want to cool them down into liquid. And if you want to cool them down into liquid, you have to go to about minus 100 degrees or so, which means that cold, uh, low temperature technologies come in. Cryo technologies, all low temperature technologies are called cryogenic technologies. So the third stage that we have is a cryogenic engine. And it uses hydrogen and oxygen to fuel the rocket, but the problem is that even if they are liquid, they can bobble up and down. So they use helium to pressurize this oxygen and hydrogen tank to make sure that they remain stable. And GSLV, for example, had to be, a moon mission had to be delayed by a week because that helium cylinder developed a leak and it is crucial to keeping the cryogenic engine running. And there's a long story to this cryogenic. We originally wanted the technology from the Russians. The Americans put a lot of weight on the Russians, and Russians wouldn't sell us. So eventually, because we had already paid, they gave us 10 engines, and we tested them out, and so on. But these are all indigenously made cryo engines, and they work very well. So this is what GSL. So uh, Chandrayaan-2 went up on GSLV. Chandrayaan-1 had gone on PSLV. And Chandrayaan-2, of course, has more weight and capabilities. So let us look at Chandrayaan-1 first. 1,300 kilograms is what it's carried, out of which only 675 kilograms reached the moon. Half the weight uh, did not reach the moon because what happens is that in the satellite, no satellite will carry the weight on its own, uh, will go on its own. It needs to be powered, so it has a rocket, small little rocket put on the satellite itself. And half the weight on Chandrayaan-1 was actually a fuel for those uh, engines, and they, uh, five, about half of it was burnt up in just reaching the moon. So about half the launch weight managed to reach the moon. It was in an orbit 100 kilometers above the surface of the, of, of the moon, and even Chandrayaan-2 will be in a 100 kilometer orbit. It was launched on October 22 and reached moon on November 8. And the question is, why did it take so long? And we'll come to that a little later. It has got something to do with the fact that because our rocket was sm uh, rockets are smaller relatively, we don't go directly to the moon. So if you look at American missions, they reach after leaving the Earth, they reach moon in two days. Our missions are much longer to the moon because we use an interesting technique. It was supposed to last for two years, but it uh, died out after 312 years because there was unusual. and some circuits inside burnt up. 
so the communication was lost and that is how it lasted only 312 days <coughs> and stopped communicating with the earth about um, after 300 odd days it had a small 29 kilogram impactor which was essentially thrown on the moon and the flag of india was put on the moon on november 14 2008 the mission ended on August 29, 2009. It had five instruments um, from India and six instruments from NASA and European Space Agency, which also it carried. It's interesting that 2016, eight years after it was um, declared dead, NASA still wanted to know whether Chandrayaan was there. So they put out a mission, they looked at the radio signals carefully, and they found that Chandrayaan 1 is still going around the sun or around the moon, except that the orbit is 150 kilometers, 270 kilometers instead of 100 kilometers circular orbit. But still there, still going around the moon. Probably its instruments are still collecting the data, but it is no longer telling us what it sees. Uh, it was a highly successful mission, and for various reasons, even though it was the 118th mission in the world sequence it remains unique for having established something which we will come to in a minute. So because we don't have a rocket big enough, when we go from Earth to Moon, we don't go directly. We essentially use the Earth as a slingshot. So we go around the Earth, and every time we are closest to the Earth, we fire a rocket so that the orbit becomes more and more oblique until it becomes so elliptical. And once and then it becomes longer and longer. Once in two or three days, you can, it comes here, you fire the rocket, and then it goes there. And it went in the direction where the moon came and caught it. I'm going to play the animation again because I think it's fun. So every time it is here, it fires. Eventually, it became so elliptical that it left the Earth. The moon is still not in the picture. As it went there, the moon would reach. And remember that this distance is 30 times the diameter of the Earth. So even though the scale looks trivial, it is actually a fairly long shot. Mangalyan, of course, was even sharper, but Chandrayaan is also fairly sharp. Uh, the scientific objectives were to look at the moon on, in X-rays and infrared to make, create a three-dimensional map of the uh, of moon and to look at how solar radiation interacts with the surface of moon, because there are a lot of questions with that. To look for water on moon was one of its major objectives, and to determine the chemical composition of the surface of moon. And it succeeded in all these. And I'll show you examples of that. This is the Chandrayaan launch, the rocket which carried Chandrayaan into space. This is what Chandrayaan looked like, except for the communication antenna, which is not shown. But essentially, it had this impactor on the top, a solar panel over here, and 11 instruments that made up the Chandrayaan mission, which went into uh, to Chandra. This is the first picture of the moon that Chandrayaan sent us from a distance of 300,000. So very close to the Earth, it said, no, I can see the moon. I know where I am to go. And it went on its way. And these are the pictures of moon that it gave us. This is. Um, Two and a half dimensions in the sense that it's not a full three-dimensional picture as you would take from two cameras, slightly reconstructed. But you can see that this is 34 kilometers across. And yet, you can see so many fine features, typically less than a kilometer across, which you can clearly see on the surface of moon. Then there are pictures like these. Now, this picture does not really tell you much, except that this 618 number, which is written over here. But if you do a proper analysis, it tells you how big this mountain is. So this is the 618 meters on the top, but the bottom most over here is minus 400 meters. So between here to here, it's a one kilometer climb. And even though you can't see it normally easily, thanks to the capabilities of Chandrayaan to take full 3D images, you now have a much better data on the terrain that makes up the moon. This is another picture again, you can you can only see so much from a photograph, but if you do a proper analysis, you see again that there is a 1,000 meter mountain from here to here, but that this is an interesting piece in the sense that something must have hit the moon exactly radially 
so that it threw up a debris and that debris made a small little mountain in the core of uh, the impact crater. This is one of the major proofs which show that moon must have been hot and boiling at one stage because in this little region of the moon, they found a tunnel. They found a, a tube, if you wish, created by hot gases that must have left the moon as it was cooling down. So this tunnel can be seen today. It is uh, essentially made from iron while the rest of the surface is titanium. And you can clearly see the tubules through which hot gases must have escaped from interior of the moon, suggesting that moon must have been really, really hot and uh, um, plasma-like at some stage from where it eventually cooled to become the solid object that it did. And you can use uranium and other data to date these things. And it comes to about four billion years, the Earth is four and a half billion years. So Moon is practically as old as the Earth itself, or slightly younger than the Earth. This is the picture that made Chandrayaan famous. This is the ch picture for which Chandrayaan will always be remembered. This is the picture of the surface of the Moon. There are gaps in the data because Chandrayaan died a premature death. But this is a picture for several reasons it's important. First is this blue color, which is water. Chandrayaan for the first time showed you that there is water on the moon, but it also gave you a detailed mineral map of iron oxide and other metals on the surface of moon. So if you want to go and mine moon, you can use Chandrayaan data to decide where you want to set up your mining factory. But more importantly, it showed water. Now water is controversial. If you look at moon and its surface, etc., you would expect all water to evaporate from the surface of moon. The only way water will survive on moon is that there are tall mountains over here, which are so tall that the sunlight never reaches there. So there, is some of, there was some speculation that there might be some ice and water over there. And Chandrayaan managed to, for the first time, show that there is evaporating water from these regions. And based on that, it made an estimate for water on the moon. And this was the first satellite to clearly map out water on the moon. Subsequently, American data <coughs> on past and future satellites confirmed that there was water on the moon. And in fact, ISRO, NASA had originally synchronized another mission to moon to land soon after Chandrayaan did. So the Chandrayaan would be still active. And one of the um, satellites was supposed to plunge into this icy depth of a crater in the hope that when the ice splashes out, Chandrayaan would see it. But Chandrayaan unfortunately died before that. But another American observation confirmed that the map of the water on moon that Chandrayaan gave was an accurate one. So this is Chandrayaan's claim to fame. Uh, if you look, the reason why everybody else had missed it is that if you look at the surface of moon, it doesn't show anything. It shows as blank and plain as ever. But if you now say, is there water evaporating from somewhere else? And the, this is the map of evaporating water from the landmass that otherwise looks very bland, but clearly water is evaporating, which means water must be underneath. The soil of moon is more like a sponge in which water has been soaked. And if you take about a meter cube of water from one of the poles of moon and squeeze it, you'd get about a bottle of water is the kind of quantity of water that exists, which means that if you want to go on moon, you really want to land in southern or northern uh, poles, because that is where there's a fair amount of water. This is the lander on Chandrayaan 1, which went and banged on the floor, and he had the flag of India. This is what is a consolidated image, if you wish, of what Chandrayaan saw in, what Chandrayaan saw in the atmosphere of moon. If the sunlight comes from here, they saw there are small magnetic fields which are good for protection against radiation. There are places from which water and other things evaporate, and they could manage to identify a whole bunch of features of solar activity or the way sunlight re, uh, reacts with the atmosphere, with the surface of moon, creating a very thin atmosphere. And in fact, Chandrayaan 2 has a special device to look at this thin atmosphere that is artificially sustained on surface of moon because of sunlight. So what did we get from Chandrayaan? We got a 3D map of most of the region of moon. Uh, we have now have a clear evidence that moon was once hot and molten and then cooled down over a period of time, giving you some idea about what must have 
happened, how moon was born. It also provided us with detailed mineralogical map, but of course its claim to fame is that it established water on the surface of moon. So that brings me to Chandrayaan 2. Chandrayaan 2 was a follow up mission of Chandrayaan 1, 10 years later for reasons that I will come to a little later. It was built on the experience of Chandrayaan 1 and one major difference was that unlike Chandrayaan 1 which was on PSLV, Chandrayaan 2 was on GSLV which gave us much greater capacity in terms of the weight of the instruments that we could send up. It was launched on July 22 and it reached the moon on August 20 and as of today uh, morning 0030 hours, it has been lowered to 140 kilometer orbit around the moon and today, uh, tomorrow early morning, the, the land, lander and the moon and the Chandra itself will separate from each other and then over a period of next five, six days, the lander will gradually land on moon on September 7. Uh, so the lander will get down on September 7. After settling down for about four hours, its flap will open, we will see, and the buggy will come out, and then we can drive a car on moon. This is what PSLV looks like. This is what Chandrayaan looks like, Chandrayaan 2 looks like. One is the orbiter that actually is the Chandrayaan. There is a lander which is called Vikram in memory of Vikram Saravai, and there is a little rover which is called Pragyan, which will go around on the surface of moon. Um, Pragyan is 27 kilograms, this is about 1500 kilograms, this is about 2400 kilograms. So essentially you have this 4000 kilogram weight carrying capability of GSLV, which is used to the fullest in sending Chandrayaan 2. This is what the buggy looks like, this is what the buggy is, it is being mated into the satellite Chandrayaan itself. This would come and fit right on top of this. This is a, is a fuel tank. You can see fuel tank is a huge part of the story. And this thing fits on top of it. And together, they have gone to moon. The mission itself consists of a lunar orbiter, which is officially the Chandrayaan-2. It also consists of a lander, which is Vikram, a launcher, which is called Pragyan. And the scientific goals include study of the topology, mineralogy, and elemental abundances and moon's exos uh, exosphere. And when the laser pointer works, I can point it to you. But the moon's exosphere is over here. It also, it studies, it will also look for signature of hydroxyl and water ice wherever it evaporates. And it will map the lunar surface in 3D so that we have a confirmation of what Chandrayaan-1 saw and data where Chandrayaan-1 missed out. So we will have a complete map. This is the Wikipedia animation of what happens at the launch. When the Chandrayaan was launched, the moon was not even over here. Over a period of few days, as Chandrayaan kept on picking up velocity, at some stage, it became fast enough, and the moon was coming in, and the two mated over here, and they went together since then. Um, to, the, to the details, to the Chandrayaan, this is the moon and it is going around perpendicular to the axis and you can see that over a period of time eventually it went through a major, when it so called reached the moon, it was in a highly elliptical orbit which has gradually been brought down in four stages. Now it is about 142 kilometers above moon in a circular orbit and in another day or so it will be in the 100 kilometer orbit. Sorry, yes, I will come to that in a minute. Sorry. Yes, yes. So I'll come to that in a minute. Okay. Let me. That is still tomorrow. You see, not tomorrow till seventh June, September. But this is the story of how Mangalyaan will go. We will come to where it will land. What are the issues related to landing and all that? Just to give you an idea of scale, the Earth is twelve thousand kilometers in diameter. The distance between Earth and Moon is thirty Earth radii, and the Moon itself is just seventeen hundred kilometers in size. And therefore, reaching that is non-trivial. So on July 22, Mangalyaan was launched. On August 15, eventually it picked up enough speed to forever leave the earth. And on August 20, it reached the moon in a highly elliptical orbit. And then eventually from there, it gradually settled down. September 1, it caught a circular orbit. It will get a, today early morning, it got the circular orbit. 
on September 7, the lander will land on moon. Just to give you an idea, launcher like I said was 3850 was the total weight of the entire thing, including Chandrayaan, Vikram and uh, the rover. Combined weight without fuel is 1300 kilograms. So, two and a half, 2,500 kilograms is just fuel. Orbiter, the wet weight with the fuel is 2,300 kilogram, but without the fuel it is just 700 kilograms, so the rest is in fuel. Vikram lander similarly, half the weight is in fuel and Prayag itself has no fuel. It works on solar cells and therefore its dry weight is the same as its lander weight. Power consumption, this consumes one kilowatt. And if you have been looking at the geyser that you use for shower, you will realize that is a fairly small amount of power. Vikram in fact is 650 watts and Prayag has only 50 watts. Uh, size wise, this is uh, orbiter is about five, 6 meters at the tallest and 3 meters around. The weight etc. we have seen. The dimensions of Vikram are 2.5 meters and the dimensions of pra uh, Pragyan is only a meter at the maximum. Uh, there are various instruments for studies of the orbiter uh, to look at various aspects of the moon and I am not going through each of these in detail because Arnab has warned me that I didn't, shouldn't speak for long. So, I am going to skip that. Uh, Vikram lander similarly has its own set of instruments to study the surface of the moon and so does Pragyan lander. Just aside from this, after Chandrayaan 1 succeeded in 2008, India actually worked on two, uh, Chandrayaan 2 in 2009 itself, but this time we wanted a buggy. And the Russians originally agreed to provide the vehicle and therefore we had to wait a little to get the car and our own high capacity rocket ready, etc., etc. But we were to schedule to launch in 2016. Then the Russians sent the simi a similar buggy to moon, uh, to Mars which failed. And they weren't sure what caused the failure of that buggy, so they backed out from their commitment to Indians saying that look our machine that we had sent to Mars doesn't work, so we don't want to give you another piece which may also not work. So the, in 2016 our Amer Russian said sorry, even though we had promised you a car, we can't give you, sell you a car. So then India decided that instead of sending a Mangalyaan Chandrayaan 2 without any car, they would develop it on their own. So India decided to develop this on their own. It took us another three years. Eventually Chandrayaan was scheduled to launch on 14 July because of the helium leak tank. Eventually it went up on July 22. Um, and in July 22 it was launched and now it is well and truly around the moon. So why go to the South Pole instead of going somewhere here? Most of the missions to moon which have landed on moon have landed in the equatorial area because the area is soft and smooth and I will show you and therefore it is easier to land. Only one mission from China has landed on the other side, but that is also in flat plains. The reason for choosing the, choosing the pole is because polar region is untouched by sunlight. So you have the original rocks that formed the solar earth and the moon still untouched by anything from the sun or it, they have not been rebaked by the sunlight of the sun and therefore they are in that sense pure. It is in permanently in shadow of craters. So we expect something like 100 million tons of water available over there and we want to see how it is. We also want to know what are the dissolved components in water because we want to know where the water, water came from. Was that water delivered to the moon at the time of its birth in which case it would be water from earth or did it come from uh, comet impacts later on. In that case the water would be primordial water but not earth like. So we want to sample that water and see what it looks like. It also probably has within it a bit of volatile material like silicon and ammonia and all that, hydro, H2SO4 and ammonia and all that which would normally have evaporated, but they probably still exist in this ice on the moon. So we want to look, uh, look at the ice on the moon. And the last of course is that if you ever want to send men to moon, it would be a good idea to send them to South Pole and in fact NASA plans a mission sometime two or three years down the line where they will make somebody land in southern pole so that they can use this water and experiment with this water. This is the landing site, this is the south pole of moon, this is where the landing site is and you can see 
that the terrain is not very smooth, which is the last of the great challenges that ISRO will face. This is the challenge in the sense that the picture that I have here is a gravity map of the moon. The gravity is not uniform everywhere because if there is a tall mountain, it will have exerted that additional pressure because it will have that additional mass. Wherever there is a flat plane, there is not much of matter and therefore the gravity is weaker. Now you can imagine that you want to land in this area where very close by there are regions of very high gravity and very low gravity. So as your Mangal, as your Vikram lander is landing, you really don't want it to be pushed astray by one of these mountains or something because the gravity itself is fairly weak. So you're gradually going down and a mountain can create vibrations in your landing. And you can also land up in a gravel where one of the feet is on a piece of stone and the whole thing may topple over. So the tr last of the great trick that ISRO has to play is to find within this a region which is smooth enough, flat enough, and without gravel so that it can land comfortably and release the lander. Uh, not on moon, but in other places, uh, uh, Japanese tried to land a, a mission like this on a meteor, and they actually had to end up with, uh, ended up with this gravel problem. So we want to be extra careful. So while landing here is smooth, in these regions the gravity does not change, you can comfortably go down, but over here the situation is a little messy. Most of the missions to moon have occurred in these planes. Okay? The last one, even by China on the other side, uh, happened in a flat plane like this, where life is a little easier when you're trying to land. And that is why even though uh, Vikram will be separated from Chandrayaan tonight, for another five days, they will just look for a site where Vikram can be landed safely, and only on 7th of December, September, they will eventually decide the site and release Vikram completely and make Vikram go down gradually on the surface of moon. This is what that buggy looks like. This is what Vikram looks like. It has the solar panel with which it will run power and it will run like this. And because the moon has 14 day night and 14 day sunlight, for the first 14 days, we are confident that the solar power will make the buggy run. After that, it will go into cold freeze because of the night and we hope to revive it after the sunlight comes again. But as of now, we have said if we can run it for 14 days, we'll be quite happy. And it will land, like I said, in the southern tip of moon instead of the more safer places near the equator. These are the last picture of Chandra moon Earth that it sent us uh, as Chandrayaan left the Earth. And these are the first pictures of moon that it showed once it got closer to the moon. And we can see that it has shown fairly detailed map of the terrain of the moon. And some really pretty pictures can be seen. This is from a distance of 4,300 kilometers, 169 kilometer wide um, uh, crater. And you can see that you can count on this crater the number of craters that have come afterwards. You can actually date these craters depending on how many craters have fallen on it after it was formed. So those kind of studies are done in great detail. And you can see that Chandrayaan has given a fairly good idea. This one is 70 feet, 71 kilometers across. And within the next week or two, we will in fact get significantly more, um, more craters. I'll just complete the story by listing out all the future Mars uh, moon missions that have been planned. There is a uh, lunar scout 2019 onwards in the fourth quarter of 2019 all the way down to 2024. There are some interesting missions by China, which hopes to land and do a sample return, return in 2020. There are no Indian missions that have been announced so far because India has its eyes elsewhere. We are looking for something else. But various experiments have been planned. There are some private experiments that have been planned, like South Korea is using an American rocket to send its own vehicle to moon. Japan is using, Japan, Russia, India, Germany, for example, is also using Falcon 9 of USA to reach the moon. China has a sample return scheduled for this later this year, which will land like Vikram did, except that it will also have a capability of coming back all the way reaching the Earth, something that we haven't tried so far. Our technology to return to Earth is still in its early stages. We have had only two experiments where we have sent something to space and brought it back to the ground but China is ahead of us in that. 
Uh, these are the more manned missions planned by, by various countries to moon. So far only Americans have gone up in on moon. There are three more Na NASA missions scheduled to put man on moon. And one of them, one of them is at southern um, south pole so that they can look at this water, etc. in detail. And Russia now for the first time wants to send a man on moon. As far as India's program, uh, future of moon is concerned, increasing number of countries and uh, private agencies are now developing technologies to go to moon. And this means that at some stage there will be commercial exploitation of moon in a fairly short period of time. And then we will have to start worrying because the exploitation of the moon in the maybe in the form of colonization, tourism, mining or whatever you have. And then this great question of who owns the moon will become an important one. So currently there is a UN governed international rules which says that moon is not owned by anybody and nobody can exploit moon for mining or the resources have to go to the common people, common all countries equally just as the oceans are not mined because it is illegal according to UN treaty just as Antarctica cannot be mined as per international treaty. We have an international treaty for uh, moon also but it is only applicable to various countries. So what happens when private agencies go up? They won't belong to any country and therefore will be transnational in nature and we need to worry about it and already people involved with laws of space have started wondering as to how to put a treaty in space which ensures that moon is not uh, stolen by some as it were and you can safely assume that if there is a Trump like president in America he is not going to listen. So this is an important problem as multiple nations come and look at the moon. In, I will show you India and Japan have a joint program to exploit and mine moon also and I will come to that in a minute. But before that I want to show you just three, two more missions that India is planning. One is so called the Aditya mission. Aditya means the sun and you can imagine if you stand on the ground the earth pulls you down. If you could stand on the sun it would be a bad idea but if you could stand on the sun the sun will put you down. Somewhere in between there is a point where the gravity of the earth and the sun is the same. It's a few million kilometers down the line from earth but essentially if you put a mission there the gravity of the earth and sun will be such that that satellite will remain stationary. There is one satellite by Americans called SOHO which is in that location. Aditya will be the second one to go to that location and it will look at the sun in great detail and should provide us with completely new data. This point where the gravity is equal is called L1 point and therefore this is India's first mission to that L1 point. The second mission is manned mission 2022. We should now have three Indians going into space. Already Ameri India has announced that four Indians are leaving for Russia to start getting trained in space travel and hopefully we will have first three Indians going into space and coming back by 2022. And we have a nice mission. So there are a whole bunch of missions now also being planned to Ma Venus and India has also announced that in 2023 we will have an orbiter around Venus in the family of various space superpowers trying to explore the planets. We also want to go and explore Venus. And last bit of story, the great, in the great story of ISRO, 2020 is where we have reached the, 2019 is where we have reached the moon, 2020 there is an X-ray telescope planned and so on. In 2023 we have announced for a mission on Venus. In 2024 there is a plan for a lunar exploration by India and Japan together to see whether we can start mining the moon. And others of course will join in that competition and we need to worry about that as we go into future. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm supposed to do it at Chandrayaan 1, but, but okay. I didn't. Huh. Uh, yeah, so there is chai outside, I hope. Uh, grab a cup of chai and come back because I'm sure you have a lot of questions and we have a lot of time. So we can have lots of questions. And I'm not going for tea, so if you have questions right now, you can ask. <laughs> then we'll wait. Okay, so
will not dissociate into hydrogen and oxygen. Easily, correct. So how? It's the sunlight and the X-rays from the sun that break the hydroxyl. So the water is bringing into hydroxyl, and you're right. What you're saying is water is an extremely sturdy molecule, but the sun. The particle radiation and X-rays are very intense. So those hydroxyl ions do not repel with each other? Do they do. So they come out as a steam, which the Chandrayaan sees. So it is hydroxyl. You are right, water is extremely sturdy, but the sun's X-ray intensity is very high. In, on Earth, we are protected because of the X-ray. Okay. Okay, so let's try and do this uh, session. I hope you're live. One sec. Yes. And if you don't have any questions, we can all go home. We are live? Okay, yes, we are live. Huh? If you have no questions, we can all go home also quickly. Okay, Vanya is ready to go home if you have no questions, so we are not going to let her go home. Uh, yes. Let's go there has questions. I'll tell you what, raise your hand. Yes, I can see you at the back. I can see you. I can see you. Okay, let's see you jumping at the back. Okay. Let's have a seat at the back. Yes, last row. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank Uh, the question that uh, repeat the question yeah, yeah. because the audience can't hear. Yeah. So the question is why don't um, missions like Chandra and look at the dark side of the moon? They do look at the dark side. So when they go around the moon, they go around the center of mass of moon. So they have to go on dark side and the bright side. So Chandra and the satellite missions will always look at both sides of the moon. The lander will land only on one side. Okay, it will definitely look at both sides of the moon. Yes. One of them has been flown up yet. Correct. But one of the claims is that moon is probably an artificial satellite that's made solely of metal, as you rightly said a couple of times. And the dark side is not visible because there is a billion civilizations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have read that. Yeah. I have read it, so I would like to ask you. There have been a couple of science fiction movies also on that. Yeah. But anyway. No, no, there are real claims. Uh, and <laughs> it is titled Lost in the Earth. Yes. Uh, and so why and how? Okay. Um, don't thank me anyway. Uh, the question, just for the sake of audience on this thing, is that is moon an artificial satellite created by a super intelligence and with it is locked to the earth so that they can see the earth and they hide in the backside so that we can't see them? Uh, the answer actually comes directly from that earlier question. We actually have an as detailed a map of the backside of the moon as the front side of the moon. So we have seen moon's backside. We know what it looks like. That is one issue. And we know that there are no civilizations there. No, there are no artificial structures on the backside. So that is one issue. The second issue is that, um, I mean, we have a fairly good idea about what the si both sides of the moon look like. Uh, Chinese have also put up a car over there to see what it looks like. Um, as far as locking of moon is concerned with respect to Earth, it's a very natural occurrence. When two objects of similar sizes happen, what happens is the moon creates this tides on the earth. Over a period of time, the earth is slowing down. And every time it creates a tide, moon feels the stress. So over a period of time, you expect the smaller body to get to the lock to the uh, larger body. In case of Pluto, both Pluto and its moon Charon are both roughly the same size, so both are locked to each other. So it is not an uncommon phenomenon. It doesn't require any artificial skills to do that. And we have seen the backside of the moon. It's quite... Uh, Norman. <laughs> yes. Yes. So Chandran is landing on the south pole. Yeah, so what kind of information will we get? Okay, the question is what do you get by making Chandran land on the south pole? The first thing is that it is going to land very close to where the water is. If you land near the equator, there is no water source there. All the spongy water that you see on the moon is in the pole. So we could have landed either on the North Pole or the South Pole for various technical reasons. It's decided that we'll land on the South Pole. So more first and foremost, we will look at rock on moon which has not been damaged by sunlight, and we will be able to see water. OK, yeah. GSLV is geostationary satellite launch vehicle. It is supposed to eventually help us launch communication satellite in geostationary orbits. Thirty-six thousand. Okay, where are the rest of the kids? Just some grown-ups also have questions. Yeah, we'll, let the, we'll get the big kids yeah. later. Okay. Small kids first. <laughs> yes. Every satellite, every satellite, 
the question is why are satellites covered with gold and the reason why satellites are covered with gold is simply because the sun is very hot and sun emits a whole bunch of radiation like x rays and gamma rays etc which can damage your satellite so on all satellites they put a blanket okay that blanket has various layers inside of silver and aluminum and what not but the outermost layer is gold because gold reflects almost all these major radiations so it is always covered with gold simply to protect it from heating it is no 25 micron it's a very thin layer of gold Okay. The question is, the question is, why does solar uh, um, rocket not work on solar power? Primarily because we don't have engines. Um, the, the the amount of power that we get from the sun is is fairly small in terms of what the rocket needs. So, if you were to take a solar powered rocket, you would need an electrical motor which can take the moon. One of the biggest problem is that. there are no unlike roads on the car there is no road to moon the only way you can go to moon is that if you release a lot of hot gases at very high speed then it by newton's third law it will push the rocket up so you need to release a whole bunch of hot gases which means you need to create massive amount of heat in a very short time so that lots of hot gases will come down and your rocket will go up you can't do it with solar power okay there are there are on the other hand interplanetary missions which once they leave the earth they will unfurl a huge solar sail exactly like you have the sails of old ships and use that solar power to move forward but to go from earth to outside the earth you need so much more power that solar energy won't give it to you okay here yeah yeah you know this ah uh, the question is whether the moon is tightly locked to the earth the answer is yes you see that there is a very small wriggle of less than a couple of kilometers you can in principle if you look very carefully for a long period of time that tilt sometimes changes so sometimes you can see a little bit more of the poles but in general you see the same side of the moon and the wriggle is very small so it's fairly tightly locked yeah go ahead uh, you said that the poles are like never neutral yeah but then how do you generate solar energy ha so that is where uh, so that is where the trick lies so you have to land in a region which is not solar um, intensive and yet you have to find a space where there is enough sunlight so that you can charge the batteries of uh, vikram so that it will dry for 14 days and that is why vikram uh, not vikram pragyan pragyan is designed to last only for 14 days because in 14 days it will go into a, a moon shadow area and therefore never see sunlight and therefore the solar cells may never work which yeah the question is which which places on the moon have uh, more gravity wherever there is more mass there is more gravity and mountains have more mass compared to the level so so mountains have more gravity yeah. uh, how does the water evaporate from the polar regions how does the water evaporate from anywhere on the moon because of the fact that sunlight comes and hits it now water somebody had asked me earlier also water is a very stable molecule so h2o is a very strong stable molecule and when the sunlight hits it that hydrogen and oxygen bond is broken so you have oh molecule and you have h molecule which are opposite polarity and that can make what oh radical come out so in fact what chandrayaan sees is not h2o but oh uh, radical from the h2o molecule so it's like a gold mountain sunlight is coming yeah so but but, the, but underneath it still gets heated okay, okay so so that is heat transfer from some from somewhere else it does not receive direct sunlight also it has some amount of magnetic field and some amount of charged particles which are deflected which don't go directly in straight line there some of these things can also fall the third thing is that the water has seeped inside from these mountains so some of this is in a region where in principle um, solar radiation can hit and make the water come up yeah oh, sorry sorry no the surface the atmosphere of the moon is less than a millimeter in size and therefore when the water radicals come out they have enough velocity to escape forever they don't yeah. remain on the surface of the moon the kids are not supposed to ask all sorts of questions let the younger yeah. kids he will decide who asks yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but essentially you won't get cloud yes yeah gentleman on the back right there yes go ahead how do you maintain an accuracy 
is a non-trivial question in the sense that um, you have two or three things. One, you have an imager where you have actually, so if you looked at all the, all the instruments on Chandrayaan 2, there's a very high resolution camera which will only photograph the southern pole where we want Vikram to land. And they will take that image in great detail. Once that image is done, they can give it to Vikram saying this is where you're supposed to land. Second thing is there are laser distance measurements. So that tells you how far you are from the surface where you're supposed to land. And yet it is risky because the, it doesn't go straight down. Okay, so it will go curve down gradually on that. So you, just like a ballistic missile, you have to give the entire program so that it goes and lands where you want it to land. It's a non-trivial exercise, yes. That's why rocket science is considered rocket science. Uh. <laughs> yes. What is? What caused the delay? What caused the delay? In, what happened is that the GSLV rocket that we are using uses hydrogen and oxygen as fuel. Now, hydrogen and oxygen as fuel um, are very efficient, but they remain gaseous in most of, uh, uh, on room temperature all the time. In order to liquefy them, you have to pressurize them and cool them. Um, so that is what uh, GSLV does, takes pressurized, cooled um, uh, oxygen and hydrogen. That is why it is called cryogenic engine, because cryogenic technologies refer to very ultra cold uh, freezing temperatures and so on. So it's a cryogenic engine, but even liquid will bubble. So when something like as big as GSLV goes up uh, to some 16, 15, 16 kilometers per second, that water can bubble uh, or liquid hydrogen and oxygen can bubble. In order to prevent that, there is a big uh, cylinder of uh, helium which pressurizes them. The advantage of helium is that it remains gaseous even at liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen temperature. Other gases would freeze themselves. Hydrogen does, uh, helium does not freeze. So you use this helium to keep the um, liquids pressurized so that they don't bubble. In that helium tank, there was a leak in GSLE. So that's why we had to wait until that leak was sealed, the hydrogen helium was properly pressurized, and then it was all go. Yeah. Uh, what happens is that the sun, up, uh, so, so what, okay. So I have this surface here um, of water, and I have some water between my finger, the, where the light will not reach. But my fingers can still get heated, and that heat can be transferred to the base of where the water is, and that will make water evaporate. And also there is direct radiation from the sun, which consists of charged particles, which does not follow straight line. So that can curve and fall into this water and make it evaporate. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What is the? So the question is, what is the effect of various gravitational regions? Essentially, if you are driving, you can get distracted. The gravity, as you go close to a mountain, there's slightly more gravity on your left compared to going down. Sorry? The south pole, the poles are more irregular. There are more mountains over there. And therefore, if you're landing, you have to be very careful. Yes. Oh, phenomenal amount. In the sense that, uh, for example, I told, talked about an um, Israeli mission. Some private businessman in Israel had taken an um, American rocket and sent a mission to uh, moon some six months ago. And the problem with that and the severe criticism of that is that they had not properly sterilized the instrument that went up in space. In that case, there are life forms on Earth which can get stuck on that, and they can go to moon. And that mission has been seriously criticized for artificially potentially artificially sending life on moon. And there are some bugs on, on Earth also, which are extremely rugged. And in principle, they can survive. So there is an anxiety that life forms have been sent to moon. But otherwise, all interplanetary missions are supposed to be completely sterilized to make sure that no kind of life form will go. Essentially, it is baked before launch so that no life forms will survive. What about the It can happen. It can happen. and. Uh, well, human beings are not known to be that responsible. Eventually, we have contaminated the whole earth. Okay, but it will be a bad idea because suppose I mean on moon we don't think there is life, but we don't know what is really there in the water. But as to the our best of our knowledge and belief, there is no life on moon. So if some bug has gone to the moon, it's just an irritation. But if it goes to Mars and potentially Mars still has some living organisms from its earlier period, in that case there will be a serious conflict with all kinds of consequences, and we really don't know how that will play out. So it's a bad idea to send living organisms from Earth to Mars. Uh, when humans go also, they will go in sealed suits and they will remain in sealed suits. 
Okay, so the life, um, well, actually that is not strictly true. Human beings have not been very responsible. So for example, when, uh, when the Apollo missions went, they actually left their human waste on the surface of the moon. In principle, it's in a sealed environment and nothing should happen, but we don't know how long that seal will remain. Eventually, it is getting heated by the sun every 14 days and stuff like that. And in principle, some germs from there also can survive on moon. We don't know. So human should beings should be more responsible, but we are not. But what's new in that? We are probably. And if there is no life form there, it's okay. But if there is life form there, then you are in serious trouble. Then you are unnecessarily creating a massive world war, come, well, war of the planets, if you wish. Yes? Uh, how did you make sure that the heat from the GSLD rockets, as it uh, travels out of your atmosphere of the Earth, uh, how did you make sure that it does not heat up the liquid hydrogen and oxygen on top of it? Ah, so that is, that is where the cryogenic technology is so precious. So, when you're sleeping at night, in winter the temperature goes to 15 degrees or so, and your temperature, body temperature is 37 degrees. So you put blanket, okay? Here the temperature goes from about minus 100 degrees centigrade to 4,000 degree, uh, to few thousand degrees centigrade where the fuel burns. So within that, you must make sure that your blankets are good enough so that heat doesn't transfer, which is why cryogenic technology is so difficult, and which is why India took such a long time to create cryogenic engines. How did water reach the moon? The obvious, the, the correct answer is I don't know. The second answer is that there are various sources which can reach. First of all, Earth has water. And if moon was formed sufficiently late that Earth had its own water, then some of the Earth's water might have been transported there. More likely, a couple of comet impact, just as meteor, we know thousands of meteor impacts on moon. Some of that could have carried water, and that water could have remained, which is the most likely source of water on this thing, on moon. The third thing is that there are some oxidized rocks on water. And in the presence of sunlight, they can in principle create water by chemical reaction. But the most likely source will be meteors and comets that have fallen on the moon. Is the okay, what about <coughs> I'll come to you, I'll come to you. If you lay near the mountain, there will be more gravity and there will be Yes. But why do you think uh, contrary on the earth, when we go up, there is a less gravity at least for some gravity? Uh, there is no, not less gravity. There is less atmosphere. The atmosphere becomes slightly thinner as you as you go up, and therefore the, the effect that you get of going to a mountain actually is that of um, rarefied atmosphere, not gravity. Gravity will be um, essentially the same. Actually, if you make a measurement of gravity, you will not see a significant change. Uh, not significantly. No, in the sense that the first measurements of the acceleration due to gravity were actually done by um, by Greeks by measuring the gravity of close to a mountain and then going too far away to a plane and that difference told you how much the mountain weighed. So initial several studies of mountains were weighed by knowing how much their acceleration is due to gravity by doing a gravity experiment right close to the mountain going very far away and you know that the difference effect is due to the mountain. So that has been done even on earth. Yes. No, nothing is coming back. Yes. So uh, we are going to leave, yeah. So for 14 days, we'll have great fun driving around, but then it becomes garbage on moon. <laughs> so it's not going to collect samples from the moon? Uh, the rover is only, only has laser finders. So it will use that laser to penetrate a part of the ground. And as that laser light is reflected and the material is ablated, there's a detector that will look at what it ablated. And that data, it will send back to us. To analyze there and then, or send the raw data back to, um, Vikram from Vikram to Chandra and from Chandra and to Earth. So Vikram, uh, uh, Chandraya, uh, Vikram, Chandrayaan and um, Pragyan will all become garbage in another two years time. Okay, Chandrayaan one is still going around the moon. Okay, yeah. So it, it's 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 yeah. It's, it's space debris is another separate question, but um, it is not spoken of in gentlemanly yeah. environment. No, no, okay. okay. The question is we are being demonized by NASA and um, I hold view contrary to the common view which I think we are right in being criticized. What happens is that, uh, yeah, anti-satellite experience. So what happens is that even when we say that GSLV had water and etc., those water molecules that were inject, ejected when the rocket went up actually remains in space. Okay, so if you look at about 300 kilometers to about 800 kilometers above Earth, it is full of garbage. 
There are little paint flakes, there are little bits of rocket heat, um, um, gases that were released, there are some residues of other particles, etc. all bunch of them. The space debris around 300 to 800 kilometers around the Earth is massive and it moves at 8 kilometers, 80 kilometers per second. So if you are an astronaut where the thing punctures you, you are dead before you know what happened to you. Okay? So space debris is a massive problem. But then humans are not house trained dogs, no. We put our garbage everywhere. Uh, Colombia, okay. So I forgot to answer the real question. Your, your question was why was India criticized? All space missions get criticized, but nobody criticizes them because everybody is at fault. Okay, so who is going to tell you that you are wrong when everybody is wrong? Okay. Yeah, so um, the, the problem comes in. The problem comes in that there is an international treaty between Russia and uh, America when they were the only two great space powers that they would not put any weapons in space and they would not develop technology to destroy satellites. China and India are not signatories to that. So both China and India have tried to have tried anti-satellite weapons. The problem with anti-satellite weapons is that you can imagine if you take a huge 2,000 kilogram satellite and break it into powder, you get massive amount of powder all moving at 80 kilometers per second. Anybody who has seen that movie, yeah. Gravity, yeah. Gravity, you would know what kind of thing. And that is a real danger. And for that, I think we deserve to be criticized. Uh, the second question, sir, you asked me something in follow-up. Uh, Colombia died because of what happens was Colombia was supposed to land on ground. You know, when, when it is lands, the bottom temperature becomes several thousand degrees Kelvin, the, the one that is facing the atmosphere because of the friction. And they protect their sh uh, shuttle by putting tiles on that, which are so good that even a few hundred degrees, few thousand degrees temperature difference, they can withhold without passing the heat in. One of those tiles fell on its launch. So the heat went inside and the inner instruments were not protected from heat, so they essentially exploded. Okay, over there. Uh, in the, okay, the question is the, what about meteor, uh, I talked about rocks in the poles of the moon which are protected from sunlight and therefore not cooked up and contaminated by sunlight, but in principle meteor high, uh, hit would have created contamination of its own. But A, meteorite contamination itself is valuable for us. We want to know what <laughs> meteorite consists of. So if I know a place which where a meteorite has, and it's very easy to see a signature of a meteorite head. Meteorites will, will damage the surface. So you can see, okay, this is where a meteorite has come and hit. This is the piece of meteorite. Like if you go to Lonar, you can see it. And therefore, you can actually identify, okay, I want to study this meteorite material, but I know when meteorite hit it, threw out a lot of material on the outside, which was the original material, so I can compare both the samples. So in fact, areas contaminated by meteorites are more precious than the ones that are not contaminated, because then you get both samples together. Right. Please, Okay. If the asteroid crashes, the question is what will happen if an asteroid crashes on the rocket? If it crashes on the rocket, you are dead. It will simply break the record. <laughs> the rocket will be destroyed completely. So you always have to worry about asteroids not hitting your rocket. You have to take great care. Except that the probability is sufficiently small. It will, it will, so far in all the thousands of planets, that satellites that we have sent out of space, only one French satellite was launched probably because of meteor hit. Others have all survived. So it's a very rare event. So you don't worry about it. But in principle, if it hits, you are dead. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Yeah, now in principle, yeah. So in principle, after 14 days, it should get back its sunlight and it should start working. My suspicion is that the way ISRO has planned this uh, Pragyan mission is that it will probably permanently go into a moon, uh, mountain shadow and will not see the sunlight again because they've been insisting that it will run only for 14 days. Because what you want to look at is what is in the shadow of the rocket. So they are, they are spending all their energy, let it go into shadow and be lost forever. But before you go down, tell us a lot of information. Also, I mean, I mean, it's unlikely that the batteries will survive 14 days of night. Dead night. night. 
ולהמניח. In what? Uh, by, by number two hydrogen atoms to one oxygen atom, H2O. No, no, the process of making, creating water reduces, releases the heat. When you take hydrogen and oxygen, burn it, if I was to burn it here, I would get a beautiful flame. And that is the energy you are using. So you are making water. What comes out of the rocket is water. PSLV is, okay, the question is where did PSLV and GSLV get their name? PSLV is called Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle and it was originally designed to put our remote sensing satellites into space. Remote sensing satellites have to go to about 800 kilometers into space, but they travel pole to pole, north pole to south pole, so that while they are going north pole to south pole, they look at the earth and because the earth spins, you can get the whole earth view without having to move. You just go north, south, north, south, as normal gravity takes you and you can see the whole earth. So all Earth observing satellites go pole to pole. And the rocket was designed to launch these programs. So it is called PSLV. GSLV is geostationary satellite launch vehicles. Geostationary satellites have to go to 36,000 kilometers and therefore you need a more powerful rocket. And so GSLV was desi is designed to take our communication satellites into 36,000 kilometer orbit and that's why it is called GSLV. And PSLV is polar satellite launch. Uh, what is exactly done to make it achieve? Well, essentially it's an engine. So what is done is, um, we all use wax. When there is no electricity, we all light up wax. And wax gives you a fairly stable amount of light for a long period of time. What you have in the, our uh, rockets, in the four, so each rocket consists of three or four rockets. So the lowermost rocket consists essentially of wax, except that unlike a twig here, they have a hole in the center. And in the hole in the center, when you decide to fire the rocket, you throw a flamethrower. So a flame lights up, it evaporates the wax and the wax starts burning. So in the entire cylinder, a wax starts burning, produces a lot of hot gases, which are then pushed down and the rocket goes up. So those are solid rockets. The problem with solid rockets is once you ignite them, you can't shut them off. And the second thing is that you can't control them very easily. The so much of hot gas comes out that it is not easy to maneuver them. So typically what, uh, what PSLV and GSLV do is to take these solid rockets to take it to a height of about 50, 60 kilometers where the atmosphere is sufficiently thin and then by that time the rocket dies and you uh, throw it away and it comes to the ground. At the second level, we use petrol or kerosene and some oxidizer together to burn, which are both are liquid at normal temperatures. The advantage of that is because they have a slightly slower burn, you can maneuver the outcoming gases in such a way that you can point the satellite to wherever you want it to go. So first take a dead, um, uh, 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 an uncontrollable engine like solid vapor, solid rocket, take it to a certain height, switch to a liquid rocket so that you can point the rocket to so a satellite to correct direction, then go back to solid again. So PSLV has solid, liquid, solid to push now that the correct direction has been obtained and in the fourth stage have another liquid so that you can exactly control and put it into orbit. So PSLV consists of four rockets, first and third are solid rocket uh, which is wax, second and fourth are kerosene and oxidizer rocket so that you go into correct orbit. GSLV, the first rocket is solid, which just takes the dead weight up. Once that is over, the second rocket is liquid and the third one is also liquid in the sense of it is oxygen and hydrogen. So you choose what you want to do at what stage of your launch to decide which kind of rocket to use, fuel to use. Okay, the question is, the question is that you hear about this role, especially in American missions, you hear about this role. Um, <laughs> what happens is that, uh, especially the shuttle, you used to hear this very often. The shuttle is stuck to the rocket which takes it up. And that has a lot of heat. In order to prevent excess of heat from coming up, they would roll it in such a way that the major thrust falls on the tank rather than on the shuttle to protect shuttle from getting heated. So rolling is done by having small, two small engines at the bottom, which are then fired for a little while to change the direction. So roll is done to protect the vehicle against space crash. Okay, uh, you need to go and do that. <laughs> yes. Sorry? Yes, yes.
Okay. The question is, the question is that normally when you want to know what mineral is there at any place, you shine X-rays on it, and by seeing what the X-ray reflected X-rays are, you can make out what is the content of the surface. It's a standard technique. The advantage here is that sunlight does the shining for you. The sun has a lot of X-rays that come out, so the sunshine, will, sunlight will fall on it, which will be your X-ray source, and look at whatever the sunlight is reflecting. So you don't have to put a radioactive source on top. Correct. 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 So the question is that we go delayed our launch by a week, but we managed to um, keep the launching landing date simply by speeding up some of the intermediate procedures so that we left early enough. So this idea of doing they probably short of one hour, they were confident enough that instead of doing five or six orbits around the Earth before you leave, you put sufficient power in one thrust so that it becomes much bigger earlier. So that's how you caught up on time. Okay, tell. Huh. <laughs> Don't get upset. Tell me. No, no, you said it in the end. Huh. So, uh, okay. what is the genesis? How did the background design on this plane shot change? You are saying that you did this. Background, okay. The question is the question is how did the idea of slingshot come in? Sorry? Yeah, so the question is how did the slingshot idea come? Um, the slingshot idea is not originally ISRO's. Um, earlier, what is, there, were, there were two or three spectacular missions that have used it. In particular, the most interesting mission was the mission that went to Pluto, American mission that went to Pluto. There was no way we could speed up a uh, satellite fast enough to reach Pluto in good time. So they actually used Earth as a slingshot, they used Moon as a slingshot, and if I remember right, they also used Venus as a slingshot, or uh, Jupiter as a slingshot, I beg your pardon. Jupiter a slingshot to give you the velocity. So the idea of using slingshot to get higher velocities has been known for some time. What ISRO has perfected it is to make sure that your slingshots are perfect to the extent of reaching the moon. But, but remember the Americans have used Jupiter's uh, gravity to pull off a mission which went to Pluto. Yeah, yeah several, yeah. Pioneer also used, so, yeah. so that's what I'm saying, that the idea of using planetary gravity as slingshot is not a new one. Yes. Yeah, the question actually that's a good question. Question is how does Chandrayaan know that it is going to the moon? Okay, it's a very obvious question. After all, it is in the space, the communication from the earth also takes several seconds, etc., and it can't go wayward. And the way they, they make sure is that they they make a simulation study to going to the moon. So they know exactly what the sky should look like around the moon all the time to the Chandrayaan. And then you keep that, so on the on Chandrayaan you keep an imager which continuously images the sky. And it should know that these stars should appear in my field of view at these locations. If they are not there, then I must change a little so that the sky is exactly as I'm supposed to see it. These are called uh, star trackers. So they track their position exactly by sky. Chandra, Mangalyan used that to make sure that it is reaching Mangal and not going haywire. So star trackers are, are routinely used even in earthbound uh, satellites, especially astronomy satellites, to make sure that they are looking at the object you are interested in. Yeah, okay. So the question is how does Chandrayaan align itself in the exact correct location, etc.? It is because it has onboard rockets. It has little rockets on the top with which it can change its position a little here and there. It, it has those rockets that are forcing it to down and go closer and closer to the moon. So it, every such mission has rockets on its, surf, on its body which allow you to fi do final maneuvering. No, orbits are predecided with great precision. So like, uh, you are hitting a 10 rupee coin 10 meters away moving at 4,000 kilometers per hour. There is no way there can be any randomness. So whatever orbits we uh, obtain for doing Chandrayaan 2 or Chandrayaan 1, like we around the Earth with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, they are fixed. 
they are fixed and computer simulated years in advance and tested and run and rerun etc because not to, see there is there is a we don't appreciate how much rocket science goes into rocket science in the sense that remember your satellite was originally 1400 kilogram and it is losing fuel so it's becoming lighter so the gravity becomes pull of the gravity becomes weaker you have to correct for that and you have to correct for all that to make sure that you are at the correct location at the correct time it's a massive calculation okay Chandrayaan 2 has half the Chandrayaan 2 is fuel, 50% of the, yeah, so what happens is that gravity is nice, it's nice and friendly, once you are there, you are there, okay, so even geostationary satellites don't use any fuel, the earth's gravity makes them go around, PSLV or remote sensing satellites don't use any fuel, it is the earth's gravity that is making them go around, once you are there, you are stuck, so just as earth going around the sun without any rockets, once you stay there, you remain there, okay, yeah. Um, okay, the question is which is the biggest, okay, so ISRO has some concept called single point failure, where if that particular point fails, everything has failed, okay. For, uh, for Chandra and if you leave the technological aspects of rocket failure, etc. apart, the biggest critical point is getting caught by moon's gravity. If you overshoot, then you are dead. So you have to be sufficiently slow when you reach the moon, proximity of moon, that your velocity is less than escape velocity from the moon at that distance, and therefore you are caught by the moon. Half the missions to moon have failed because they were not slow enough or they were so slow that they went and banged on the moon. So but we have already cleared that. that we have well and truly cleared that. Yes. So my question is if the first paper forms in a water and what you talk about the it uh, the water which is present in it just revolves around the uh, it and it just escapes it. And most of the water is present in the between. So now, if we consider moon as a sperm, then can it be a combination of uh, the evolution was changed, the water had escaped it, and is now at relatively center of the poles or something? Okay, the question is that if I take a sponge in which I have soaked water and if I centrifuge it, essentially the water will move away. You don't know. Okay? The question is whether the same thing has happened on moon. The th reason why that doesn't happen is two reasons. One thing is moon ro revolves very slowly. It takes 27 days to complete one revolution. So the centrifugal forces are not very strong. The second thing is that there is some amount of chemical latching that will happen because these are not sponges in the sense of rubber sponges, these are iron sponge. So it is stronger in holding and the centrifugal force is less. In principle, <laughs> otherwise everything can go off. Yes. Yes. We don't. Uh, in the sense that we do know within about a square kilometer or so, but so the way India launches rockets is India, okay, just for the people on the web. The question is how do we know where the first stage rocket has fallen on the earth, okay? And the thing is that we know the trajectory exactly to the nearest meter, near, nearest 10 meters or so, okay? So we know exactly when the separation is occurring because we know how long the rocket is going to run. So we know that about uh, 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 three or four minutes after launch, the rocket's first stage is going to break off. We can calculate exactly where the rocket is. And therefore, and because it falls by gravity, which is essentially a projectile motion, you can exactly calculate where it will fall to within about a square kilometer. Yeah, so the question is, the question then is what if it falls on somebody's head? Uh, which is a genuine question, okay? It has happened to at least one Chinese rocket which fell on a village and destroyed the village. What India does, what India, the, the way you launch the rocket is you launch from west to east. So India has its launching station in Sri Kota, and if you look at the geography of Sri Kota, the entire launch is above the sea. By the time it comes over land in Indonesia, it is so far high that even if something falls, it will burn in the atmosphere. So we have chosen Sri Kota so that the entire launch is over the sea. And there are no islands in between, so that nobody yeah, will get hurt. Ha, so maritime ships are warned in advance, okay? And they form a much smaller cross-section. But they are warned in advance that, look, Indian uh, rocket might come and fall on your hand, better not be there. So there's a whole cleared area, and there's a whole, so launching a, launching a rocket, it's not just a question of igniting the rocket, okay? It's a whole bunch of things that go with that. Sorry? If the water is evaporated from the moon, yeah. 
Yeah, it goes into free space. It is lost forever. The question was, what happens to water that evaporates? It is lost forever. Huh. No, so me, no, no, the Apollo missions left the species on the on the on the floor of moon, as it were. In principle, you can spend send a mission there to pick up that bag and bring it back and see what happened to it. I am not aware of a mission that is doing that, but in principle, it is possible to do that. Um, what happens is that because those things are kept in a sealed environment, there will be some oxygen still left inside that environment. The question is whether the uh, whether uh, the bacteria in the fishes survived or not. It's a question you can ask, and I am, in principle, you can do that. I don't, I'm not aware of a mission to do that. I don't think they're landing next to Apollo. Huh? You haven't asked. How dynamic is the landing? The landing is extremely dynamic in the sense that um, right now, ISRO's um, Chandrayaan mission is taking massive number of photographs every time it is at the South Pole. Based on those photographs, they will roughly make an estimate that from 100 kilometers up, I can see that this region of the land in southern pole region where I want to approximately land seems to be safe enough. Then tonight, they will detach um, Vikram from, the, from Chandrayaan. Then as that Vikram keeps going down over the next three, four days, it will keep taking at the image saying that, look, Chandrayaan told me to land here. Is it really safe? And as it keeps on getting higher and higher resolution, it will actually decide its landing site within a meter saying this is where I'm going to land. It's completely dynamic. Eventually, in the, on, the, uh, on the 7th, on the morning, 2 o'clock on 7th, Chandra and Vikram actually lands on moon. Okay, 7th um, September morning, 2 o'clock, or 1.55 or something like that. Okay, so only by 6th evening, they will know exactly where they are landing. Yeah. Sorry. In fact, sorry, in fact, just to complete the story, um, when Apollo 11 went, they actually had to spend several more orbits because they were not convinced that they are landing at a safe place. And they were very, very scared that they were running out of uh, landing uh, capabilities and re returning capabilities. So at some stage, they took a risk. And it turned out to be well. <laughs> Is that done? <laughs> that, did it land? Yeah. We know. We can. You, if you have a good enough telescope at home, you can take a picture of Apollo 11 landing. Yes, yeah, so what I'm saying is when, 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 uh, when okay, the question is did, uh, did uh, Neil Armstrong land on, uh, on moon? When Lin, Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, he had two rockets on top of him. One of them landed and the other top piece came back. The lower piece is still on the moon. If you have a good enough telescope, you can take a photograph of that. There can't be greater evidence than that. Why there are so few men landing on the moon? It's expensive. It's only a question of money. All right, all right. Let's, let's, let's follow people whose hands are up. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, is there any? Backup for manual landing. Okay, so when you have manual landing, so far there have been no backups. In the sense that if a na Neil Armstrong's return rocket had failed, he would have been dead. He would have died. He would have been the first man yes, to die on moon. Chandrayaan. Chandrayaan has no backup. There is no sense in backup. It's cheaper to send another mission. mission. Interplanetary missions are so expensive that you do really don't see it send two of them so that one of them lands and the other one says, okay, fine, come on, I'm going to So it's not done. It's not done. You risk everything on that. Don't ask a question. You have your hand up. You're done. Okay, there's one at the back. Then. Yeah. Yes. Um, in principle, it can find the landing spot. So if, if ISRO is confident that yes, yes, we have found everything, there is no sense in waiting till 7th, we'll go down earlier, they can go down earlier. Uh, but they may not be, the 7th may be chosen because it maximizes the 14 day Yes. It, uh, yeah, so that might be another. Um, yeah, but you, if you land on 5th, just keep the rover in for two more days and then release it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The acceleration? No, on, on moon there is no air. On earth, no, no, the, okay. The friction comes simply because you are running through um, gas, air, no moisture. 
while you are landing it is thin atmosphere and increases the intensity the density of air as you go down in launching the initial density is the highest and as you go up it becomes less and less and less so your calculations are completely reversed also the speeds are very different right yes, speeds are very different in one case you are you are yes. having yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Yes. So Chandrayaan and Vikram both have fuel, kerosene and oxidizer. None of the two, uh, well, uh, uh, if you look at Vikram on the side of it, there are solar panels. So that solar power it will use for communication, but for its maneuvering it is using regular fuel. Will it not? Freeze. Uh, will it not freeze? No, you take great care. Okay, so there are two things that are done. Uh, the first thing is that the blanket on which it is put, blanket works both ways, but you have to get rid of the blanket once you land there because otherwise your solar panels won't work. But you pre-calculate the amount of heat that it will see and cool the heat the system in case it is getting very cold. So you actually put mechanical heaters exactly as you would use in your house to make sure that the fuel does not exceed the temperature either way. So those things are done pre-calculated with great precision. And Chandrayaan one failed because one of the components got heated beyond our calculated values and it burst. So even though Chandrayaan is still going, one is going around the moon collecting data, it is no longer able to send it off. The question is how far are we remitted by record technology or rocket technology 100 percent. So GSLV is only 4000 kilograms, normal American rockets typically take 10 to 20,000 kilograms. Okay. So for example when they send man to moon, their rockets are heavy enough that they go straight to the moon. They put enough fuel on it, go straight to the moon and in four days flat they reach the moon. We take 48 days. So as we get better engines, we will certainly want to go in four days. Who wants to spend 48 days when you want to do four days? Yes, so far our strongest rocket is GSLV Mark III, which is the best we have at the moment. The rest, other rockets are still under development. <laughs> what are the benefits of um, space travel to common man? There are various answers I can give. The first answer, of course, is nil, since um, uh, Chandrayaan technology is not useful on Earth. The second answer that I will give, which I think is more correct, is that at the end of the day, nobody lives by bread alone. You need ideas, you need thoughts, you need creation, you need achievements, you need goals. Okay? That's what makes a country great. And going to moon is a non-development of a non-trivial technology, and therefore it provides, uh, space sciences uh, take up some of the best brains of India. You tell them to just keep on sending communication satellites and remote sensing satellites, they'll get bored out of their bones. Okay? You need to give them new creativity, new challenges, new achievements, etc. Okay? And as a fraction of ISRO's budget, it is minimal, less than 1%. The third thing is, yes, the new record technology, a whole bunch of things that we need. Space science is eventually develop a whole bunch of technology. Today you get good X-ray scanners in your medical equipment because they were originally developed for ast astronomy. So space sciences give you that. The third answer is, the th he's shouting at me, sorry? A cell phone camera comes because of space technology. The third thing is, the third, so there are a lot of secondary technology. <laughs> comes. The third and the most important thing is the one that I put on my last slide, which is at some stage moon is going to be mined. And if we are not on the moon at that time, we don't get mining rights on moon. Simple as that. Is warp drive possible? Sorry, warp drive, no. Yes. Um, so what happens is, what happens is that no single person makes a mission. So India announces that we are doing space mission. So there is one specialist team that will work on the, on the logistics of the rocket and the logistics of reaching, etc. There will be another bunch of scientists who will say, I want to put this instrument, that instrument, that instrument, that instrument on spaces. Then now ISRO goes through a variety of procedures, eventually decide that these are the instruments that will go. But the scientific data from each instrument belongs to the person who made the instrument, but it remains with him only for one year. After one year, they are required to make the data public so any other scientist can use it. Do you have fixed uh, instruments on 
That's right. Yes. No, we have five, and five on Chandra and two, then some on rover and some on the. And six is we are uh, uh, Yes. Yes. Uh, generally, scientific missions you don't charge. We don't pay you anything and you don't pay us anything. So the development of the instrument, you have to give me ready instrument to my specification, to my precision for which I won't pay you a dime. But as a matter of courtesy to a friendly nation, you take it up with me. So, In fact, to the extent that originally when Chandrayaan-2 was announced, India insisted that we will take no foreign mission. What happened on Chandrayaan-2 is that five of the 11 instruments were um, foreign mission instruments. And in fact, the water was identified by an American mission. Chandrayaan-1. Chandrayaan-1, sorry. Chandrayaan-1. And uh, we, we were very unhappy with the way. NASA is very efficient at publicity. So not many people realize that this great map of water on moon has come from an Indian mission. It comes from an American instrument is how they announced it. So India was very unhappy saying that you are taking credit for a mission that was on Chandrayaan-1, but you are not, you're putting Chandrayaan-1 as only a byline, but you're saying that your instruments are the moon. So India was very unhappy. So when Chandrayaan-2 was announced, India said we'll take no foreign instruments. Sorry? Yeah, it, it's a good publicity mechanism. But eventually, NASA managed to convince India to put at least one NASA mission, instrument. So one NASA instrument is there. Otherwise, India's plan was, even for Mangalyan, we didn't take any foreign instruments because it's a question of credit. Yes. How solar panels are used for communication? Solar panels are used only for producing electricity. Yeah, so what happens is solar panel gives you power and energy. And there are dish antennas, exactly like you have on your television. Um, if you do one of the DTH television, you get this antenna which is stuck at the house. Exactly same kind of antennas are stuck. What the solar panel does is only provide power for running the dish antenna. Okay, solar power, yeah. So what I meant was that solar power is indirectly required for communication, not directly. It does not communicate on its own. It only produces electricity. Okay for communication, not okay to propel satellite. Yes. For that, there is a separate proper company. Uh, this is where I'm getting the question of the question. Yes, sir. Uh, this is massive and the calculation is quite complex. Uh, the question is, the question is, sorry. Between Mangalyaan and Chandrayaan, whether Mangalyaan is much more complex because it's talking to us. Okay, so the question is twofold. One is, do we take into account the space debris as you go into space? And the second question is, is Mangalyan more complicated because it crossed the asteroid belt? The second question first, asteroid, uh, um, asteroid belt is beyond Mars. It will be in Mars and Jupiter. Even then, there are enough number of pieces of rock in between to create a nuisance. Uh, we don't have a detailed data of what is how much of, so you can typically track a big piece of rock. But a small piece of rock, typically a few millimeters in size, there is no way our technology will see it. So you have to risk it. Even space debris for all its nuisance in absolute quantities is not much. So what they do is they make the aluminum shield and the solar, pa that um, blanket, solar pa blanket is multi-layered so that it will absorb this kind of impact. And even then, the satellite body is generally made with sufficiently hardened aluminum so that it does not puncture. So typically a few millimeter thick aluminum, hardened aluminum, and the solar panel should take care of debris as far as um, as far as the, your rocket is concerned. Even then, like I said, one French rocket satellite has been lost, and astronauts are eternally scared of uh, gravity kind of things. So that fear remains, but you just risk it right now. There are several missions being planned to clear the space debris. So the Japanese have a plan to set, take a satellite up, release a massive sail, and then just make it through the satellite. So all these pieces of dust will get stuck on this um, this uh, flash sail, and then eventually throw the satellite to ground. Like a vacuum, so, like a vacuum cleaner, yes. Like a jhadu, actually. More like a jhadu than a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 No. Pragyan is only looking for hydroxyl and other metals. Uh, to look for la organic life, you have to obviously ask, how do you know organic life? It doesn't add a spectrograph to see if the uh, carbon-based molecules are there or not. In that sense, it will not detect life. It only looks for heavy metals because it is using X-rays and laser pointers. And second question, the Chandrayaan-1 mission is still operating in connection with data. Yes. No, because Chandrayaan-1 is a 600 kilogram. There is no recorder on that. So it sees sends it to the circuit which is supposed to send it to the earth, that circuit is dead, so the data gets lost. <laughs> yes. 
Yes. Sorry. Yes. So how does that affect by taking five more or six more satellites? Um, it costs you one thousand rupees to launch every gram of weight. Not six satellites. I just repeat the question. You're not taking six satellites. You're taking six experiments from them. So little things, five hundred grams, one kilogram things. Okay. And every weight adds up. So you want to minimize the weight. How does it help? Because they have an instrument that can do some scientific work for which you don't have an instrument. So either sit and build it on your own, which can take several years, or just borrow it. And the data is shared. And the data is shared. It's a question of logistics. So where, where is it less rocky to land? Okay, my apologies. ISRO has apparently issued a note saying that I should say southern polar region and not south pole because we are 20 degrees north of the south pole. 70 degrees south is the latitude. The question is whether you can do agriculture on the moon. <laughs> and it's a non-trivial question for several reasons. If you want to live on the moon, you cannot take all the food from here all the time. It makes no sense. If you look at the soil of moon, it is full of rich metals. On its own, it will not be good enough. It, it will just be able to save some of the rough, harshest crops. But the problem is the sunlight is very harsh. There is no atmosphere, so there is no oxygen to breathe. And therefore, the plant will die in that radiation immediately, except for some microbes that Israelis have sent. Um, so if you take a sealed perspex container where you can control the oxygen inlet through an oxygen cylinder, you can grow a plant using uh, lunar soil. So in that sense, that the first Martian, that Martian ka movie is not scientifically inaccurate. You can grow things. OK, California 98? Yeah. Yes. Okay, the question is that suppose while you are landing, if something goes wrong in the sense that you hit a boulder or something, what happens to the satellite? It is destroyed. It is damaged and destroyed, depending on how hard you hit it. So it will get damaged and destroyed. So you have to be very careful when you're landing it to make sure that nothing like that happens. Um, the first question is how do you control the rover? It is entirely autonomous. It takes light about a second to reach from the sun, a little more than a second. Sorry? From the moon. From the moon to the earth, it takes up more than a second or so. So you don't have enough time that rover says, I'm here, tell me what to do, and then you go back on the earth, somebody looks at that data and says, okay, fine, go down a little. You don't have time for that. So it has to be entirely autonomous. So artificial intelligence things on that, or whatever it is worth, but it's an autonomous mission, it lands on its own. The second thing is nuclear power. Now, nuclear power is a fairly dangerous thing to have because if something goes wrong with your rocket engine, that radiation will be spread all over the country, all over the atmosphere. So there is an international law which bans you from sending nuclear reactors into space. It is being violated. And especially under the Indo-USSR agreement, when the, there were the only two superpowers, it is explicitly banned under that treaty. Now, um, Trump has canceled that treaty. So recently, Russians tried to send a missile with um, a nuclear power on that, and it burst, and all kinds of problems have occurred. But in principle, you are not supposed to send nuclear material into space. But there have been discussions that nuclear power probably will make an excellent fuel for long distance travel. So there have been secret experiments, but as of international understanding, you should not be sending radiation. Nuclear space, uh, waste into space is an idea, but then typically you, uh, a rocket will be useful only take a, if you take a ton or more at a time. And if it were, the, the risk of that rocket failure is so much that nobody is willing to try. Okay. Uh, last two questions. Yes. Yeah. Where you are there, the first one,
You also ask, okay? You don't ask. Come on, you don't ask. No, no, that's okay. Okay. Go ahead. Anybody ask? ask? Anybody ask? Ask, ask, ask. Yeah, here, here, here. Sorry, Chandrayaan one is using no fuel. It is in the gravity of the moon. So just as Earth goes around the sun without gravity, moon goes uh, without any rocket. Moon goes around the Earth without any rocket. Chandrayaan is going around one is going around the moon without any rocket. It will keep traveling ad infinitum, except that over a period of time the solar radiation keeps hitting it. So it is gradually, very slowly losing its momentum. Uh, if you are unlucky, yes, it is quite likely that Chandrayaan 1 might fall on Chandrayaan 2, but the cross section is very small, the probability is very small, but in principle it can happen. So once uh, moon missions become regular, you will have to worry about debris around the moon also, yes. Sorry? Yes, but 59 of them went ahead of this thing. So 52 missions have gone, but uh, the um, uh, Apollo missions left nothing behind. All the vehicle recovery missions have left nothing in the space. The number of satellites around the moon is fairly small, man-made satellites. But you will have to worry about it at some stage, yes. Yeah, so Cassini was the last one to be powered by a nuclear reactor, but it is always very dangerous to do that. So we want to avoid using nuclear power in space, but there has been discussion that maybe you should allow them for deep interplanetary missions because sun is becomes very weak as you go away from the sun, obviously. So what other power source you have? So there have been discussions, there have been developments, but generally it is considered a bad risk to go into space and Cassini must have gone through a much larger number of security tests and safety tests before it was allowed. But in general, you don't do that. But for deep interplanetary missions, we probably will not have a choice. International Space Station is at 365 kilometers. It is not capable of launching anything. It does not, if, if you were to launch a rocket from the space station, the station would come down, simply by Newton's laws. It is, it is a factory. Some rare drugs are made there, and some other rare materials are made there, which are made in zero gravity compared to Earth. And therefore, it is used for laboratory as well as for some technology. Yes. No, it is going to land entirely automatically without any human control. There is, they have put enough number of programming and intelligence, artificial intelligence on that so that it can look after itself. Okay, I, I know that there are lots of questions that are still not answered. Please send us a mail, we will get Vahia to answer all of sure. them. Sure. Uh, these people kind. Uh, kind. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Followed by crystal growth, followed by something happening here, which